Today we're diving into a classic book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, by Stephen R. Covey. Covey is celebrated as one of the 25 most influential figures in American history. Throughout his life, Covey has met with over 30 world leaders and has advised four U.S. presidents. So, what are these seven habits that have captivated so many? The seven habits can be grouped into two categories. The first set of three habits. Be proactive, begin with the end in mind, and put first things first. Help us transition from a dependent personality to an independent one. As we grow, we go through three stages dependence, independence, and interdependence. When we're kids, we look to our parents for answers, right? Mom, what should I do? Dad, what should I do? We are dependent. Transitioning from this stage to independence requires us to adopt these first three habits. After this transformation, another three habits come into play. Think win-win, seek first to understand, then to be understood and synergize. These habits help us transition from being independent to interdependent. It's interesting. You might think that being independent is the ultimate goal, but if you're too self-reliant, you miss out on the benefits of interdependence. Once you've mastered the first six habits, you can go from being dependent to independent and then to interdependent. The seventh habit, sharpen the saw, ensures you continue to grow in an upward spiral. A critical part of all this is our mindset and how it needs to shift. Why do we live life in a certain rhythm and struggle to break free from our challenges? It's often because we have ingrained ways of thinking that we revert to when facing any situation. One of the most famous examples in psychology involves an ambiguous image that can be interpreted as either an old woman or a young lady. Ever seen that picture? Here's how the experiment usually goes. A professor first shows a version of the image that leans more toward the old woman interpretation to one group of students. To another group, he shows a version that looks more like a young lady. After both groups have had a look, they're brought together and shown a balanced version of the image. The moment the professor asks what they see in the picture, the room erupts in debate. Half the class is adamant it's an old woman. Like, how could you even question that? The other half insists it's a young lady, someone they'd even like to date. Both groups think the other is clueless. Only after intense discussion and pointing, see, this is clearly her neck, right? No, that's her nose. Look closely, it's the neck. Do some people start to see the other perspective? So what's the takeaway? The most intriguing part of this experiment is that when you have a preconceived notion in your mind, it's challenging to make an objective judgment. You're trapped by your mental frameworks, and unless you critically examine and alter these frameworks, you'll be stuck in the same life patterns. It's like you don't have ten years of experience. You have one year of experience repeated ten times. Stephen R. Covey emphasizes that a shift in mindset can be a game-changing tool. Let's consider a real-life example. One day, Covey was on a subway ride in New York. A father and his children were also on the subway, and the kids were acting out, causing a disturbance. Everyone around them was clearly annoyed, and the father seemed to be in a daze, doing nothing to rein in his children. Covey was initially irritated and thought, what an irresponsible dad. Taking matters into his own hands, Covey approached the father and said, somewhat resentfully, could you please control your kids? The father snapped out of his daze and apologized, saying, I'm sorry, we just left the hospital. Their mother passed away an hour ago. We're all a bit lost right now. Suddenly, Covey's perspective shifted. Initially, he had judged the situation with a critical eye, believing the father should be responsible for his children. But with this new context, he realized the family was in a state of shock and grief and the father was emotionally incapacitated. Covey's irritation turned into empathy. He immediately apologized and offered to help in any way he could. This is what Covey refers to as a shift in mindset. Sometimes we are quick to draw conclusions based on our preconceived notions, thinking we're absolutely right, 
But the concept of changing one's mindset can be a real eye-opener, don't you think? So, our ability to view things from different angles is incredibly powerful, a testament to our capacity for self-evolution. What does Stephen R. Covey mean by a habit? According to him, a habit is an intersection of three key elements, knowledge, skill, and desire. It's where the I can do it, I know how to do it, and I want to do it circles intersect. Ultimately, what shapes our lives are our habits. Changing a habit can be as challenging as launching a rocket. In the first few minutes of a rocket's ascent, the amount of energy expended is greater than what it will use for the tens of thousands of miles it travels in orbit. Similarly, the most difficult part of changing a habit is often the initial phase, the first few days or weeks. Once you get past that hurdle, maintaining the new habit becomes much easier. So, forming good habits is essential for genuine life transformation. But what should be at the core of our mindset? Covey talks about how some people center their lives around their families, while others focus on their careers, money, personal freedom, children, or even environmental concerns. Each person has their own priorities. However, Covey warns that if you center your life on these variable elements, you risk veering off course. Someone focused solely on their career may lose their family, while someone overly devoted to their family might miss out on a fulfilling life. Covey emphasizes the importance of having unchanging principles at the core of our lives, drawing an analogy between a lighthouse and a ship. The lighthouse represents these unchanging principles which should guide us through life's complexities. This is the significant takeaway from Covey's Seven Habits. Center your life around principles to create a stable mindset. All right, let's dive into the first habit, which is be proactive, one that I personally admire the most. Many people struggle to define what proactive really means. When asked to be more proactive, they question what the word entails. In essence, they can't articulate the difference between being active and being proactive. To truly grasp this concept, you need to start with a new idea, the ultimate human freedom. Stephen R. Covey greatly appreciates the book Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, who survived the Auschwitz concentration camp. Frankl discovered that the ultimate human freedom is the power to choose, regardless of circumstances. Covey also identifies this as one of his most significant life discoveries, noting that there's a gap between stimulus and response. In life, many people operate on a stimulus-response level due to three prevailing deterministic theories. The first is genetic determinism. I'm hot-tempered because it's in my genes. The second is psychological determinism. I'm this way because my parents treated me poorly as a child. The third is environmental determinism. I have to be this way to survive in this cutthroat world. All three theories shift responsibility outward, stating that your reactions are predetermined by external stimuli. Eleanor Roosevelt once said something incredibly insightful. No one can make you feel inferior without your consent. In other words, unless you give someone the power to harm you, they can't touch your self-esteem or inner peace. Take, for instance, when President Roosevelt's home was burglarized. Many people wrote to comfort him, and his response was quite telling. He expressed gratitude for three things. First, that no one was harmed. Second, that not everything was stolen. And third, that he was the victim rather than the perpetrator. So, who should really feel bad here? The thief should feel worse. I haven't done anything wrong. Why should I be distressed? From a philosophical perspective, freedom means breaking social inertia. The automatic reactions we have to external stimuli, like getting angry when someone steals from us. But when you can break away from this inertia, you'll find a huge space for choice. A truly proactive person will never easily give up this freedom of choice. So I'd like to ask all of you, would you easily surrender your power to choose? I believe many would say no. I am proactive and I strive to take control of my life. Stephen R. Covey believes that to truly have the power of choice, you need four pillars, self-awareness, imagination, 
conscience, and independent will. With these four elements, you won't easily surrender your freedom to choose. Here's an intriguing example. A student approaches the professor to request a leave of absence from next week's class. I have to attend a tennis team practice, otherwise they'll kick me off the team. I'm sorry, but I have to go. The professor replies, I can't approve your absence. Have you considered the consequences of missing my class? The student hesitates. Well, the worst case scenario is that I lose some points. You're not going to expel me from the course. The professor challenges him. So weigh your options. Is the tennis practice more important than my class? The student decides. You won't expel me, but the tennis team will. I can catch up on your class by borrowing notes from classmates. So I choose to go to the tennis practice. The professor agrees. All right. Why did the professor initially refuse but later agree? It's because when the student first said, I have no choice, I must go, he displayed a dependent, passive personality, as if he had no control over the situation. But when he later said, I've weighed the pros and cons and I choose tennis, he took responsibility for his choice. Life is the sum of your choices, whether you like it or not. So never easily give up your power to choose. That's the first lesson. A man once approached Stephen R. Covey and lamented, I've lost all feelings for my wife. Our love has come to an end. What should I do? Covey's response was straightforward. Then love her. The man was puzzled and said, You don't understand. I don't love her anymore. Covey reiterated, Love her, sir. Love is a verb. When you realize that love is an action, you understand that you have a choice. Feeling powerless means you've relinquished that choice, and that's the fundamental essence of being proactive. But being proactive isn't just about making a choice. Suppose you say, I choose to give up on myself, or I choose to fight with him. That may be your choice, but is it proactive? No. So there's a second aspect to being proactive. Focus on what you can control. In life, we have a circle of influence and a circle of concern. The former involves things you can change, while the latter encompasses matters you can only comment on or worry about. The key to success, something common among all successful individuals throughout history, is to channel your energy into your circle of influence. If you constantly fret, complain and blame others, you're investing your energy into your circle of concern, causing your circle of influence to shrink. So. When you're uncertain or struggling, ask yourself, what's in my circle of influence and what's in my circle of concern? Focus your efforts on the circle of influence and things will improve. It's okay to be concerned about other matters, but don't waste too much energy on them. Have you noticed that many people in today's society waste an enormous amount of energy following trending topics or arguing with others online? Instead of this, why not read a couple of good books, learn something new, and focus on improving yourself? That is where your circle of influence lies. So you've grasped the first habit. Be proactive. Starting today, you understand that being proactive involves two elements. First, you have choices. Second, you should focus on matters within your circle of influence, not your circle of concern. The book also references the serenity prayer, Asking God for the serenity to accept things you cannot change, your circle of concern, and the courage to change the things you can, your circle of influence. The wisdom to know the difference isn't always apparent. After digesting this book, I realize the fundamental distinction between the two circles boils down to your attitude. Your circle of influence is defined by whether you're actively looking for solutions or just sitting around complaining. Next. Let's talk about the habit called begin with the end in mind. Cuvée gives a vivid example. If you're traveling to Detroit without a map, how can you reach your destination? Or if you don't even have a destination, how can you complete your journey efficiently? Life is similar. If you don't set predefined goals, how can you expect to achieve anything? Goals can be adjusted. You can change direction. But you have to have an aim to guide you. Covey states that every action involves two levels of creation, one in your mind and another in reality. The former corresponds to leadership, 
you have to know where you're going. The latter corresponds to management. You have to execute effectively. Many people neglect the mental aspect of creation. They're stuck in a cycle of doing without thinking. You lack creativity when your mind isn't engaged in envisioning what you truly want. That's what begin with the end in mind is about. The end here refers to your ultimate goal, which is crucial. Covey suggests that you imagine your own funeral. What would people say about you? How do you want to be remembered? Pondering these questions can help you draft your personal mission statement, essentially your life's constitution, outlining the principles and goals you'll abide by. Stephen R. Covey has another book titled The Seven Habits of Highly Effective Families, which is also worth exploring. In it, he discusses the value of a family mission statement. It's a way for everyone in the family to understand the collective goals, fostering love, supporting each other, and continually striving for individual and collective growth. Open communication is encouraged to tackle any issues. Essentially, it's like drafting a constitution for your family to truly begin with the end in mind. Now, what should be the center of one's life? We've talked about people who focus on money or career. Consider this. If you segment your life into phases, prioritizing college admissions before 18, focusing on higher education from 18 to 25, centering on career growth from 25 to 40, and then starting your own business from 40 to 50, how would that work out? For instance, if getting into a good college is your life's focal point, household chores may seem burdensome. You might neglect these duties, losing a sense of family responsibility. When you're career-centered, what happens when your child comes to you asking to play? You may end up neglecting your kids. And if entrepreneurship is your focus, your spouse's concerns might be brushed aside as additional stress. Imagine this. You're 50, your business is a success, and you have lots of money. But your children have turned rebellious, and your spouse has left you. Would you still consider your life a success? When you find your life revolving around a single focus, it's a pitfall many people find themselves in. Some even risk their health to amass wealth, thinking it's all worth it because that's the only thing they're centered on. It's truly unfortunate. Stephen R. Covey argues that you shouldn't be centered on any one thing in such a one-sided way. Instead, be principle-centered and make these seven habits the core tenets guiding your life. So, what does a principle-centered person look like? Covey describes them as being confident in their choices, focused on the outcomes, and at peace with themselves regardless of the results. They have an inner clarity that frees them from internal conflicts. People who center their lives around principles often display remarkable insight. Their thoughts and actions are uniquely grounded, driven by a stable core that provides a strong sense of security, direction, wisdom, and power, making their lives both fulfilling and positive. Therefore, the second principle is to begin with the end in mind. Identify the guiding principles for your life and write down your life's direction. What kind of person do you aspire to be? This extends even to the smallest of tasks. Before doing anything, identify what you aim to achieve. Setting goals is one of the most fundamental skills in leadership, encapsulating the second habit Begin with the end in mind. The third habit is about prioritizing what really matters. I remember a fascinating experiment that Stephen Covey conducted. He invited a woman on stage and presented her with a bucket full of small pebbles and several large rocks, each labeled with important life elements like family, vacation, and so on. Covey asked her to fit all the large rocks into the bucket, which was already filled with pebbles. Despite her efforts, she couldn't make them all fit. Finally, she had to make tough choices, like removing the rock-labeled family, which she, of course, didn't want to do. Covey then suggested trying a different approach. The woman agreed, so he emptied the bucket and told her to place the large rocks in first. After they were in, he poured the pebbles and sand back into the bucket, and everything fit perfectly. The message was clear. It's all about prioritizing what's important in your life. Many of us are overwhelmed by the small pebbles in our lives. When your day is filled with such distractions, there's no room left for what really matters. So the key takeaway is to carve out ample time for what's important and ensure it gets done.
leisure and other activities can easily fit around these priorities, relieving stress because you've addressed what truly matters. This is time management, Covey style. His philosophy isn't about tackling urgent and important tasks first, but rather focusing on those that are important, but not urgent. For those interested in learning more about this, you can check out the book Getting Things Done, The Art of Stress-Free Productivity. The third habit, then, is to prioritize what's most important in your life. Always remember the rock and pebble experiment. Make time for what truly matters first. After mastering the first three habits, you've basically transitioned from a dependent personality to an independent one. You can now control your time, make your own choices, and focus on what truly impacts your life. The next leap is to become interdependent, which involves intricate relationships with others. This brings us to the concept of the emotional bank account between individuals. If you're constantly withdrawing from this account without making any deposits, you'll quickly find it empty. Take the relationship with your children, for example. Initially, you may have a substantial emotional balance, especially when they're very young, but as they grow and you start nagging or criticizing them, you're making constant withdrawals. By the time they hit adolescence, they might become distant or even rebellious because the account is empty. The love and communication have broken down. I've seen this in many families where the emotional accounts have dried up. Stephen R. Covey uses a great analogy in his book. Imagine you own a goose that lays golden eggs. It's great to have a daily golden egg, right? Some might even feed the goose more to produce more golden eggs. But what if you get greedy and decide to cut open the goose to get all the golden eggs at once? You end up killing the goose and there are no more golden eggs. So it's crucial to keep making deposits into these emotional bank accounts. Balance is key. It's all about the natural laws of give and take, not just immediate gains. Some fundamental ways to invest in emotional accounts include understanding others, paying attention to social cues, keeping promises, setting clear expectations, maintaining integrity, offering apologies when needed, and giving unconditional love. These are the basic approaches for investing in your emotional bank account. Why do we start with this? Well, as you transition into an interdependent life, the most basic principle is to invest in emotional bank accounts. In the journey of cultivating interdependent habits, the first and foremost is the win-win mentality. Stephen Covey demonstrated this by inviting someone on stage to arm wrestle. He also invited a third person, saying, Sir, you look well off. Would you sponsor us? The man agreed to give a dollar to whoever won. As Covey and his opponent wrestled, it became clear that both were fixated on winning, but neither could earn that dollar. Then Covey suggested, How about we make a deal? You let me win one round for a dollar. Then I let you win one, and we go back and forth. The sponsor was baffled, thinking, How much money is this going to cost me? But the point is, we're often so focused on beating the other person that we miss out on the opportunity for a win-win. To establish such a mentality, the prerequisite is a relationship built on trust. This requires a healthy balance in the emotional bank account between the two parties. Of course, not all relationships can reach this ideal state. Cuvée points out that if a win-win can't be achieved, it's better to opt for no deal. This is also a win-win outcome because it saves both parties from wasted effort and resources. And that's the fourth habit, the win-win mentality. The fifth habit is seek first to understand, then to be understood. And it's all about the art of listening. Many people are poor listeners. They're already formulating their response within three seconds of the other person speaking. This makes communication a frustrating process. Take, for example, a visit to an optometrist. You tell the doctor, I'm having trouble seeing clearly. The doctor responds by handing you their own glasses, saying, Try these on. They work perfectly for me. You put them on and complain of dizziness and blurred vision. The doctor is baffled, insisting, but these glasses are perfect for me. It's a frustrating experience for both of you because the doctor isn't really listening to your specific needs. 
We encounter people like this in our everyday lives, those who insist that what works for them must work for everyone else. What they fail to understand is that their solution is like a pair of unadjusted glasses to the other person. The missing element here is active listening, which is critical for the habit of seek first to understand, then to be understood. When in discussions or collaborations, the best thing you can do is talk less and ask more, allowing the other person to express themselves. A crucial technique for this is called empathic listening. You should be able to articulate the other person's feelings at that moment without passing judgment. People often can't help but judge, which usually leads to what's known as an autobiographical response. In this type of response, your mind is fixated on your own narrative, jumping to value judgments or speculating on underlying causes, such as childhood trauma, or even taking on the role of an advisor, offering unsolicited advice. These are traits of autobiographical listening, and they can be incredibly frustrating for the person trying to communicate with you. Let's talk about empathic listening, a concept that might not fully resonate unless discussed in detail. Imagine a child complaining to his dad about how boring school is, how a classmate dropped out to start an auto repair business, and how he thinks that's a good life. What's the typical dad's response? You're too young to understand. Education is essential for the future. This is autobiographical listening, where you're keen to impose your own experiences and judgments. Now let's demonstrate the right way. The child says, school is so boring. The dad replies, it sounds like you're really frustrated with school. Here the dad is mirroring the child's feelings. The kid continues to complain, and the dad says, you feel like what you're learning at school isn't practical or useful for you. Notice the dad isn't judging or even questioning. He's empathizing. The kid mentions his friend John, who's now a fantastic mechanic, saying, that's practical. The dad keeps his judgments to himself, even if it's painful, and says, you believe John made the right choice. This kind of conversation opens up a meaningful dialogue. Eventually, the kid reveals that he's worried about his reading level, which is far below his grade. The dad just repeats his son's feelings back to him, and this opens up the son to talk about his real issues. So, what did the dad do here? He didn't judge, didn't advise, and didn't try to steer the conversation. He simply reflected his son's feelings back to him. This approach is powerful and worth trying. It allows the other person to feel respected and understood, which is the essence of seek first to understand, then to be understood. That wraps up the fifth habit. The sixth habit is about synergize, which means achieving greater outcomes together than we could individually. Stephen R. Covey points out that nature exemplifies this synergy perfectly. Trees, shrubs, grass, microorganisms, and animals coexist, each contributing to the overall health of an ecosystem. Similarly, to synergize with others, we need to engage in creative collaboration. Covey outlines three levels of communication, defensive, respectful, and synergistic. Defensive communication stems from a win-lose mindset. Respectful communication is more about compromise, but synergy True win-win interaction is where we aim to be. Two key elements to achieving synergy are respecting differences and stimulating creativity. When you encounter someone with a different viewpoint, the best response is to show curiosity and respect. Say something like, I see we have different opinions, and I'm really interested in hearing your perspective. This opens the door for creative collaboration. You can then ask, would you be open to brainstorming a better solution together? So, by respecting differences and fostering a creative environment, you can truly achieve synergy, maximizing everyone's contributions. With these six habits, you've graduated from being dependent to independent, and now you're moving into the interdependent zone, where you can collaborate effectively with others. The final principle is about continuous renewal, which is essentially a spiral upward journey of growth. Stephen R. Covey suggests that there are four areas where you should aim for constant improvement. 
intellectual, physical, social, emotional, and spiritual. Intellectually, you can focus on reading and learning, even though it's often a challenging process. Physically, consider practices like meditation, exercise, wellness routines, and eating healthier. On the social and emotional front, seek to build more meaningful connections, contribute to the community, and regularly invest in your emotional bank accounts with others. Spiritually, aspire to higher cognitive abilities, develop your own philosophy, and establish a framework for understanding the world, your core values. All four dimensions require constant learning and updating. Covey presents this as a spiral upward process involving three steps, learning, practicing, and persisting. When you learn something new, put it into practice. Once you've practiced it for some time, make it a habit. Then learn something new again and repeat the cycle, constantly rising higher. Learning and implementing wisdom is undoubtedly valuable. The key is whether or not you can persist and put it into practice. This becomes the essence of your life, integrated into your very being.